Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Otolaryngologic Clinics podcast. I'm Jessica McCool, the managing editor for the series here at Elsevier. Otolaryngologic Clinics is a bi monthly publication consisting of review articles centered on a central topic. Today, we will be discussing the May 2017 issue on multidisciplinary approach to head and neck cancer. Here now is consulting editor Dr. Sujana Chandra Shaker to lead the discussion with issue guest editor Dr. May St. John. Hi, this is Sujana Chandra Shaker. I'm the consulting editor for Otolaryngologic Clinics of North America, and it's my pleasure today to speak with Dr. May St. John. She is the Samuel and Della Perlman Chair in Head and Neck Surgery at UCLA Geffen School of Medicine and co-director of the UCLA Head and Neck Cancer Program. Dr. St. John, it's a pleasure to have you here with me. So, Dr. Chandrasekhar, it's really my pleasure, and I really want to thank you for the opportunity and thank everyone at the Odo Clinics for the chance to share with everyone uh, the import of multidisciplinary care for head and neck cancer patients. So, thank you very much. You're very welcome. We're going to be talking about the edition that you edited, as you said, Multidisciplinary Approach to Head and Neck Cancer. It was published in August of 2017. Um, I really enjoyed reading this clinic. I think um, it gives both the general otolaryngologist, the non-head and neck specialty otolaryngologist, and the head and neck specialty person a chance to look at this uh the newer way of treating patients and their families uh, as they go through the process of identification, confirming diagnosis, treatment, and rehab. And I, and I think the way you put it together was really uh, spectacular for that. Additionally, I think you have such nuggets in here that other people who interact with patients with head and neck cancer, such as social workers, nutritionists, radiation oncologists, radiologists, uh, uh, chemotherapy oncologists, I think all of these, uh, speech and language pathologists, I think all of these people can benefit from reading some or all of this clinic. So I want to thank you for putting together really a really interesting group of authors and topics. Well, I want to thank you once again for the opportunity, and I really, I think the title of our first chapter, It Takes a Village, uh, really the credit is due to everyone I work with, uh, to the patients who really put forth their needs and are able to express them to us and give us feedback as to what's working and what they need more of, and to my entire uh, team here at UCLA, because this is really a product of many people's expertise coming together, and that's really been a privilege for me to work with everyone. Well, you know, building on that, when you say multidisciplinary, that's a word that's thrown around a lot, and maybe it means different things to different people. What do you mean by that? Do you mean, well, you have a bunch of non-physicians working for you? Um, what kind of setup is a multidisciplinary approach? Let me start by kind of sharing with you how I really began to become passionate about this area. And of course, there are many centers around the country that have been leaders in what we uh, traditionally call multidisciplinary care. Uh, the reason I was so uh, impassioned about this topic is that one of my dear friends was diagnosed with a non-head and neck cancer approximately one year ago. And at that time, uh, he sought opinions at several uh, top-notch institutions throughout the country. At the end of his journey, um, he shared with me where he was choosing to have his care. And when I asked him uh, why uh, he wanted to do this, he said, this is because um, when I went to certain centers, I would meet with a surgeon one day, and they would be outstanding and speak to me about their approach. And then a week later, I'd meet with their hematology oncology specialist. And another week later, I'd meet with a radiation oncologist. And although everybody was compassionate and expert, it really seemed that no one was talking to anyone else. And I think um, in medicine today, even outside head and neck surgery, there are so many silos. We all know that in treating complex problems, uh, it really takes a, a group approach. And not only because we have been trained in different disciplines, but also in terms of how we relate and understand our patients. And so... For me, what became very important was, you know, if a family member or dear friend of mine had such a complex diagnosis, what is the best way to approach this and what would I want? So um, in treating head and neck cancer patients, we know that patients come in where surgery is clearly the option or where surgery is clearly not the option. 
Um, but I think all of these patients are really looking for compassion. A lot of them are in pain. And so instead of really trying to treat people in areas where we haven't had much training, it's very important to try to treat the whole patient and bring expertise of people who are passionate about caring for patients. And the truth is, when these conversations and when this care occurs, the interactions are much more than a sum of their parts. It becomes a very dynamic conversation, a dynamic patient-centered conversation, which is really, I think, the best thing we have in the future for these patients. And I was really impressed that that first chapter that you're alluding to had authors from UCLA, from Tufts, and from MD Anderson. So not only did you do a multidisciplinary approach, but a multi-institutional input to that, which I think is very helpful to our readers. When in the, in the second article, uh, Beers, uh, Nilsson, and Johnson talk about shared decision-making, and that's another very popular term um, these days. What, what do you think that means to the patient and their family? Uh, I personally think it's hard enough to understand the nuances of cancer care, of the complex, complex anatomy of the head and neck that we deal with, um, what surgery or chemo or radiation will do. So it's hard enough to understand that as a physician. Do you think giving patients all this information or so much information overwhelms them and their families? So I think um, it's always very important to realize that patients come to us seeking our training and expertise. But I think that the second part of that relationship, which I think uh, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Nielsen, Dr. Beers have put together, um, is really important. And that is that it's really essential that we understand the patient's values in terms of what their priorities are, for them to understand that they have to make a decision, but to really elicit their preferences, their goals, and their priorities in looking at outcomes. One of the very important things that we have integrated and numerous centers have integrated in multidisciplinary care is we have expert psychologists who are mind and body psychologists who have worked with head and neck cancer patients in particular. Their role in our multidisciplinary clinic is essential. Um, after we have the one hour kind of high level discussion about the uh, medicine aspects of the case, we then all go to meet with the patients in a combination of surgeons, hematology oncologists, pain service, psychologists, all in the same room at the same time. And their role is to really kind of understand and listen to what the physician is telling the patient and what the patient is telling the physician back to ensure that there's clear and adequate communication. I don't think multidisciplinary care and allowing the voice of the patient to lead the discussion means that we just lay out options and allow the patient to choose. It's really our role to say this is what we would offer a family, here are the risks and benefits, here are the possible outcomes, and then the patient can choose. A lot of times we can say, this is the consensus of the conference. Patient may say, this is not acceptable to me. What is the second best consensus of the conference? But of course, there has to be direction because patients do not have the background and training. But it's very important to be sensitive to individual patient um, opinions as to their quality of life and what they would like to choose because it's very different when you're sitting in that chair. The perspective is often very different. But as uh, physicians and surgeons, it's important that we continue to direct our patients as to what we would want done for us or for our family. I reflect on during my residency what some of the harder edged, hard nosed cancer surgeons might say about your approach today. My initial response was, wow, they would think this is really touchy-feely. But my real response is, I think that's what they were trying to do. And you have accomplished, all of you, all head and neck cancer oncologists uh, doing this, have accomplished what they've been trying to do, but didn't have the buy-in from the other specialties. So it, it really is really impressive. Um, you know, when I think about imaging, I, I supervise residents, and it seems to me that uh, PET CTs are being ordered. Uh, it, it's sort of a normal thing that's done at every single visit. So uh, as a, as a non-cancer otolaryngologist, can you tell me when PET CT is indicated in these patients? It's a very good question, and I think it's a broader question as to when are, when is imaging indicated, either at the outset or in terms of treatment. You know, we work with a lot of people who, you know, there isn't a direct guideline. We actually did a review paper to look at uh, when these scans should be ordered, and um, Obviously, it depends on the nuances and specifics of the case, but oftentimes a PET-CT scan is indicated at the time of diagnosis 
so we can ensure that the tumor is really local or local regional and that there aren't any surprises in terms of distal metastases, which would affect the initial treatment plan. After that time, imaging is really reserved for approximately once a year unless there are symptoms, and even some guidelines say that imaging does not need to be performed unless there are symptoms that the patient is reporting. Now, um, of course, with a PET-CT scan, it's important for patients to understand that these PET scans were really optimized in lung cancer, not in head and neck cancer, and there's a lot of research ongoing currently to look at different metabolites that may be more um, important and play a more central role in head and neck cancer. So I think it's very imperative and important for us to teach our trainees um, to look at evidence when looking at ordering uh, scans. But in our multidisciplinary conference, we often do order PET-CT scans, and not only to look for distant metastases, but also to make sure that there are correlations between what we see on the CT scan and the PET avidity. Um, some centers where PET-CT scans are performed are not comfortable or do not do a sufficient volume of PET-CT scans for patients with head and neck cancer, and those scans then become somewhat uh, not as um, meaningful in terms of evaluating the patient. So I think it's important when we do send patients for a scan that we send them to a center where they do do a lot of head and neck cancer protocols, and there are radiologists that we really speak with. And I think that's a very important part of this uh, multidisciplinary concept is a lot of times everybody's working in their silo, and you can read what an imaging report uh, says. But really, by coming to conference, you know, our neuroradiologists are able to tell me even pathology based on looking at these scans because there's so much discussion about how the patient presented, what the mass looks like clinically, and uh, really gives us a much deeper level of understanding of how to approach the patient's care. That's terrific. As we move along your, uh, your clinics, the article by Dr. Margie Brandline Weber, um, who, is a, who is a pathologist I happen to know personally, uh, I, we worked, uh, we had offices right near each other at one of our institutions, and um, I found that she was very unusual in that she was very comfortable speaking with patients and their families and going over not only the pathological diagnosis, but the um, prognosis as she understood it. So um, uh, her article uh, mixes pathologic slide diagnosis with outcomes tables, and she keeps the patient at the center. Uh, I know that the pathologist attends your tumor board. How often are you talking with your pathologist outside of the tumor board? I personally speak with our pathologists at least four or five times a week. Um, so a lot of my colleagues and I here at UCLA, when we do a cancer resection surgery, we go up to the frozen section area, look at the slides ourselves with the pathologist to give them a context. You know, a lot of pathology is not just what you see on the slide, but how is this tissue correlated and related to other tissues in the area? And it's very difficult in the head and neck when they get a blob of tissue to really kind of understand the orientation, the depth, and what we saw in scans and what we saw clinically in the operating room. So it's really kind of a team effort. Um, our pathologists here at UCLA come to the tumor board conference, and of course we have the secondary review of all outside slides that come to us. And it's really important for us to take a look at this together because sometimes uh, a lot of these cases that come as a kind of recurrent or metastatic disease, it's very important for us to understand the subtype of head and neck cancer. And of course, as we all have seen, there are cases where benign diagnoses are sent in as malignant and the reverse, malignant diagnoses are sent in as benign. Uh, so I think that it really, once again, the context, the discussion, uh, Putting this directly with the radiographic images that are viewed, with the clinical context, and discussing with the surgeons, and discussing clinical trials, it all comes together as one unit. So it's not segmented, and people are making decisions based on fragmented pieces of knowledge. So here at UCLA, it, we really do speak with the pathologist frequently. Uh, we all speak to them you know, on cell phone. We all have kind of personal relations with them in terms of uh, taking care of patients. And that's true across all departments. Uh, when I was reading the article by Drs. Jackson and Schmalbach, um, I was really impressed with the, with the innovations that are happening in head and neck cancer. Um, I know that the article talks about stereolithic modeling, 
talks about sentinel node biopsy, transoral robotic surgery, and intraoperative navigation. Can you tell me and our listeners a little bit more about stereolithic modeling and 3D planning? So there really is a lot of excitement, and I'm very excited about this because as a translational surgeon scientist, I really am always thinking about the confluence of technology with surgery. So um, this area about 3D virtual planning is a really exciting area. Um, Of course, when we're doing reconstruction, it's very important for our patients to completely restore their function, looking at their mastication, their articulation, and obviously their airway patency. Uh, and a lot of our patients who have head and neck cancers, as uh, many of our listeners know, the tumor has eroded through the mandible or has changed the contour of the mandible. So in those cases, we are not able to do an interoperative um, planning in terms of how we bend the metal plates. Uh, and that was one of the main kind of um, impetus for why these uh, surgeries came to be. But really, uh, what happens is there's a preoperative 3D virtual plan, and we get together with the reconstructive surgeons, the head and neck cancer surgeons, the oral maxillofacial surgeons, and also the companies that help us in making these models. And what we're able to do is really discuss uh, where we think the tumor will have to be resected, discuss the part of the uh, bony anatomy that needs to be reconstructed, and these companies have gotten so uh, precise that the models are reportedly within less than 0.01 millimeter uh, of the patient's natural anatomy. And so in looking at this, patients can now uh, directly have a reconstruction that completely simulates what they had preoperatively, and they can even get implants interoperatively. So all of that will be done by the time they have their surgery complete all on the same day. So um, in looking at kind of 3D modeling and 3D planning in terms of kind of the future beyond uh, bony reconstruction, these applications can apply to patients uh, who, for example, have a vocal cord paralysis. Instead of having people free fashion thyroplasty implants in the operating room, ahead of time, we can have an actual uh, 3D uh, thyroplasty implant made, which completely would um, overcome the defect that we see on the MRI. So that's a pretty exciting area. Um, As far as intraoperative tumor margin delineation, this is uh, an area of research that I've been very involved in, and it's been a very kind of um, an area that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, It really started because I had a patient uh, several years ago, a 32-year-old woman who presented with an oral tongue cancer, and she and her husband came to see me after having been to several centers around the country, and her husband asked me two very salient questions. He said, number one, Dr. St. John, uh, we have a two-year-old and a seven-month-old, and I would like to know how much of my wife's tongue you are going to take. And the second is I would like to know, after you take it out, how will you know that you have completely removed the tumor? Two very important and heavy questions that weighed down on me as I had uh, young children also at the time. And so uh, after uh, the day came when I was uh, to operate on her, And I was driving into the hospital as I was backing up my car. I got too close to our front gate and the car started making a beeping sound. And I thought, well, my car knows when it's near something that is of a different um, texture, if you will, or density. And so when I'm really operating on these patients, in addition to using kind of visual, obviously, uh, techniques and also uh, palpation, there's really nothing further we're doing. And so when we're resecting tumors, uh, the the density of the tumor is very important in terms of how we resect it. So I went in and did her surgery. I went out and spoke to her husband in the recovery room. I told him all the margins were negative. But deep down, I kept thinking to myself, we really should do better because when we do frozen section margins, we really are sampling, you know, 10 points out of a matrix of a thousand points or more. So that day I went and uh, signed up to give a noontime engineering lecture series on our needs in terms of translational niches in the head and neck space. And then this uh, set up a really beautiful collaboration with um, some of my engineering colleagues here at UCLA and also across the country, where we are now down to 40 microns in terms of specificity of looking at tissue, whether it be cancer or non-cancer in the operating room. Uh, This is real-time imaging, and a cancer cell is about 10 microns. So the goal is to be able to really see where the cancer is interoperatively and be able to resect the right amount. By that, I mean I'd like to get completely negative margins, but we also want to make sure that we are not over-resecting in patients who need this function to continue their lives in a way that's meaningful to them and their families. So I'm really excited about this prospect, and we're continuing in a clinical trial here at UCLA and hope to roll this out, obviously, across the country and across the world. 
That is really uh, extraordinary. And given that we learned uh, head and neck cancer surgery by taking huge margins and being willing to deal uh, or have the patients deal with significant defects, the fact that you can remove the defects while still taking care of the cancer is an extraordinary uh, achievement. I just want to take a quick pause here to let our listeners know that they can receive an exclusive discount on the issue we are discussing today by visiting us.elsevierhealth.com slash expert. Just to remind our listeners that I have the distinct pleasure of speaking with Dr. May St. John, Chair in Head and Neck Surgery at UCLA Geffen Medical School and co-director of the UCLA Head and Neck Cancer Program. And we're talking about uh, the clinics, uh, the Otolaryngologic Clinics of North America, August 2017 edition, Multidisciplinary Approach to Head and Neck Cancer. So, May, you're one of uh, seven authors uh, talking about the two-team approach to ablative and reconstructive surgery, and I thought it was really good that you included senior residents and fellows as authors uh, in that article, because they're the ones who really run the interference to make sure everything that's needed for both teams is available, that something is just not missing right at the right moment. Can you tell our listeners what you might experience as a pitfall or a negative in bringing two teams together in this way. The impetus from this article really came from the fact that a lot of times, you know, we get referrals in from um, a variety of specialists sending us patients where, you know, the margins are positive, deep, or lateral, sometimes same day, sometimes, you know, uh, weeks later, and patients come to us saying, well, I don't know if they took the whole tumor out or not. And it sets us on this kind of um, journey to try to identify what the true margins were, and sometimes we have to re-resect patients and find that there's no tumor in the specimen. You know, in speaking to uh, my colleagues, and I think communication always is very important as it is in every facet of uh, operations, is really when I go in and or when head and cancer surgeon goes in to resect a tumor, the whole goal is I need to resect this tumor in its entirety with negative margins. Whereas the objective and the goal of a reconstructive surgeon is really, well, here's the defect, how can I close it? If we break down the question into two parts, then we are absolutely certain that each team is focusing on its objective. Sometimes when someone has not really thought about head and neck cancer or been trained in head and neck cancer, they may just resect it as one would resect a lesion and then close it. Uh, Because even if um, one thinks, well, I would like to get clinically negative margins, they may think, well, if I make the incision just a little bit smaller or a little bit different, the closure is going to be that much more aesthetic. So I think it's really kind of working within those goals. And when we've kind of parsed it out, it really hasn't created any type of um, negative kind of feelings or any kind of tensions because the reconstructive surgeons are you know, outstanding what they do, and they come in and see a defect, and they're kind of challenged, like, wow, this is exciting, and this is how I'm going to approach it. And the head and neck surgeons are able to really kind of focus on making sure that there are negative margins. And honestly, I always think, kind of thinking back to a multidisciplinary approach, that a lot of times we get some really new and exciting ideas about how to approach things by speaking together. And so by involving our trainees uh, on both sides, it really kind of allows them to think beyond just operating within one's own confines, whether it's one's own training or one's own capacities, and really opens it up to say, you know, surgery and patient care is a team sport. I was looking at the the article on radiation oncology by Hegde, Chin, and Chen, and you can tell me what kind of uh, causative factors for head and neck uh, carcinomas have changed that maybe make the radiation dose a little less intense or a little more intense. So I think that we are very fortunate at our academic medical centers to work with radiation oncologists who are also trying to innovate and look beyond what has been passed down. Um, Obviously, there were uh, many trials looking at uh, organ preservation um, in the earlier uh, years of head and neck uh, cancer 
treatment. But now we have a cohort of radiation oncologists who are looking to see, do we really need to give 60 gray to every area or 70 gray to every area? Uh, we are very fortunate to work with a team here at UCLA that was very interested in looking at both intensity modulated radiotherapy or IMRT to really look at how we can use that more precisely and work with speech and swallow therapists at UCLA prior to the patient even starting radiation therapy in a post-operative setting or just in a pre-radiation setting to continue to improve their long-term swallowing and xerostomia outcomes. Uh, you know, several, re several papers, including papers here at UCLA, have shown that if patients start this therapy before they start undergoing radiation, that their swallow can be completely preserved. Uh, and we have uh, um, actually published that we can actually minimize the number of patients who become G-tube dependent as a result. Another area, of course, that has... Uh, become very important is that of the HPV-positive uh, squamous cell carcinomas of the oropharynx. And with the new AJCC uh, guidelines being published recently in terms of staging these tumors, um, of course, we've been having uh, transoral robotic surgery, which has really kind of changed the face of how we treat this disease. But also in terms of the uh, radiation therapy protocols, whether it's primary or in the adjuvant setting, there are many de-escalation trials uh, going on around the country in terms of what is the total dose that needs to be given postoperatively or even in the treatment setting, and unilateral versus bilateral therapy. So once again, these trials are very important in looking at a cohort of patients where the majority of patients have a very good response to therapy, regardless if it comes in the form of surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy, or a combination of the above. So we're very fortunate to have these trials ongoing, both at UCLA and nationally and internationally, to see what's best for our patients. And once again, this is something that really comes out of a multidisciplinary approach. It could not occur in just one clinic that's being run by radiation oncologists without really a dialogue and looking at the numbers of patients that are required to innovate and move beyond this. One of the very exciting things that I think we're also looking uh, at here at UCLA with our radiation oncology team is we have been able to design a polymer which can be seen when you put the patient through the CT simulation prior to radiation. A lot of times after surgery, the radiation oncologists are reading a pathology report and a surgical report and maybe calling the surgeon and saying, well, should I give a higher dose to this area or the other area? If we were able to put polymer samples down in the areas where we had uh, greatest concern about the tumor, then the radiation oncologists would have a map, if you will, of how they could do their simulations and therapy. So there's a lot of room for um, innovation, and there's a lot of room about thinking about how can we continue to treat our patients, provide them better outcomes, and better function. And then if you can um, expand on that to when you decide for chemotherapy or when the group decides that chemotherapy, whether it's um, platinum-based or some other type, how do you introduce that idea of chemo and when is it absolute and when is it a uh, possibility? Generally speaking, when we talk to our patients about the possibilities, uh, once again, our hematology oncology group is very active in our multidisciplinary cancer program. So when a patient comes in, you know, the options really are, you know, can we treat this with surgery? And if we treat it with surgery, what is the likelihood of them requiring post-operative radiation or even chemotherapy? So some of the indications for adding chemotherapy to radiation ex include uh, extracapsular extension in the neck or include other uh, features such as paranormal invasion, especially in a patient who's immunocompromised. When we talk to patients about chemotherapy, and as you and I both well know, of course, there are agents like cisplatinum, which have been tried and true for many years. But of course, there are newer generation agents uh, such as cetuximab, and the side effect profile is quite different. Um, we discuss with patients everything up front in terms of the outcomes, the likelihood, the possibility of recurrence, and what adding agents would mean in terms of quality of life and length of life. Once again, it's a discussion we have in the presence of our mind and body psychologists. I would say that surprisingly, the large majority of our patients, I'd say over 85% of our patients when we do have chemotherapy discussions with them, are very open to this because they've come to us saying, I want to live, I want the, the highest chance of survival, and they are willing to be open to what we recommend. And so I think, once again, it's a very clear communication, clear communication about outcomes and goals and understanding, and then working together as a team, uh, I think things have been pr very successful. You know, yesterday we went to a baseball game, and I was driving home, and my sons and my daughter were remarking to them to each other 
that they couldn't believe there was a day when people actually had maps made out of paper and they had to look at them to figure out where they were going or how to get home. And they wouldn't be told where the traffic was heavy. And they, they just couldn't imagine such a day. And I will tell you that, that conversation aged me about 100 years because I am very good at reading maps. So I wonder if you and I at some point are going to be in our rocking chairs and reminiscing about those bad old days when precision genomic therapy was not routine, routine or targeting for programmed cell death was not routine. Uh, can you tell me where we're going with even more precise targets? Yeah, so I think that um, one of the very uh, salient quotations by Sir William Osler uh, in the late 1800s was, if it were not for the great variability among individuals, medicine might as well be a science, not an art. And I think really in terms of personalized medicine, um, this article really kind of covers what the definition of personalized medicine is. And the definition that they put forth is that precision medicine is really the determination and delivery of the right therapy to the right patient at the right time. Uh, of course, we kind of live at a time where we look into integrating genomics, technologies, and all these uh, advances in genetics to really kind of provide the best therapy to individual patients. Um, as the article very clearly delineates, there's a lot um, in terms of big data and understanding what is a true driver and what is just a passenger. And so it once again involves a very large number of people with a large amount of expertise in understanding, uh, obviously, computational statistics and machine learning. Um, in terms of kind of when is this going to really become a reality, I mean, we do have stories like Herceptin in the breast cancer field that has really changed the survival for, uh, you know, millions of women around the world. Um, and so we do often see some possibilities. However, in terms of tumor heterogeneity and the true targets and head and neck, we're still continuing to work on what some of these targets may be, which would allow us to develop a Herceptin or Eureka type precision medicine cure. Of course, one also has to keep in mind with the heterogeneity of disease that with treatment and with the passage of time, we understand that the mutations that become the most important may change. And so in terms of really kind of translating this in a very quick manner to each individual patient, uh, I think that that's really kind of a big data question that's really kind of ongoing. But the first thing we have to do is we really have to understand the proper targets in each patient and each tumor to make sure that we are really targeting the drivers. And so a very exciting field requiring a lot of expertise, um, but we still have a few years to kind of uh, get to uh, the, the targets in precision medicine. And would you say that's similar for immunotherapy in head and neck cancer, or is that a little uh, more globally um uh, applicable. So, um, immunotherapy in head and neck cancer has now been FDA approved for patients with uh, metastatic or widely metastatic or recurrent disease. Of course, a lot of our data comes from the melanoma field, and UCLA has been a real leader in that area um, in terms of looking at immunotherapy. Uh, currently, there are several ongoing clinical trials uh, adding, adding immunotherapy excuse me, to uh, standard regimes, and so I think that in terms of that, we are a little bit closer in terms of treating our patients with this, uh, particularly patients with head and neck melanoma, but also in the recurrent metastatic setting. Uh, the trials are ongoing now, so we can identify... Um, benefit uh, in these patient populations. You know, you started the this clinics with an article about what a multidisciplinary team is, and then you went through all of this sort of more aggressive medical, surgical, radiation, chemo treatments, um, and then I think you go and have a really terrific article by the University of Michigan group uh, talking about the head and neck multidisciplinary tumor board, and that leads really nicely into what the patient and the family experience is. So I know that you already mentioned pain and pain management. Um, you know, pain is front and center in the news these days, right? We are, uh, as physicians, very leery about um, uh, creating or propagating a problem with drug dependence. We're also very leery about having our patients suffer uh, in pain. Um, what do you think are the salient points regarding the acute and chronic pain that a head and neck cancer patient can experience 
and, and what the physician, perhaps leading the team, needs to be aware of. One of the things in seeing our head and neck cancer patients is that when they come in uh, to our clinics, uh, one can see that regardless of the treatment that would be recommended, whether it be surgical or chemotherapy or radiation therapy, um, a lot of times these patients are just present with pain, and that's really what's most debilitating. Um, one of the reasons that we thought it would be very important to include our pain team in terms of the multidisciplinary approach is that head and neck cancer pain is really multifactorial, and the patients really benefit from a multimodal approach. As you mentioned, uh, the opioid epidemic going on in this country uh, is really a product not only of you know patient needs and patient um, utilization, but also because we do have a cohort of physicians and providers who really don't have the background in terms of which medications are best for which types of acute and chronic pain. And we're used to prescribing a certain group of, you know, three to five medications, which we continue to prescribe, but those medications may not really be meeting the needs of the patient. So it's really an area of expertise, particularly in head neck cancer patients where these tumors are growing in very sensitive anatomic areas that are affecting a lot of our functions, including swallow, speech, uh, and many other areas. And so, so for us to really get these patients in to experts who really know what the best regimen is so they don't have to suffer in pain uh, and that the pain is really kind of managed in a way that they are not then over-medicated or being treated with agents that they don't need to receive has been really imperative. You know, as a head and a cancer surgeon, you know, I'm used to prescribing certain medications post-operatively, but I'm, you know, not an expert and haven't received the training and which medications are best for which type of pain. And so this has been something that I say, you know, a lot of patients come in in pain and now we're able to really help them in a way that I think uh, one practitioner cannot help them with. And I think as, as you go forward to sort of the, the patient-centric or the outcome-centric or even I, I might say the quality of life during recovery and later centric portion of care of these patients, um, I was really impressed with... Uh, and you've already mentioned the psychosocial, the social worker, the psychologist who's involved, who kind of helps your team and the patient and their family uh, communicate properly with each other. Um, one of the other points that's really important in these patients is nutrition. When you look at nutrition, I, I like the fact that the article by Madnick and Morasso looked at it not only from the speech and swallow therapist approach, but also from the social work family life perspective. So can you give our readers a take-home message or two about how we should assess and treat nutritional issues in our patients, both during treatment uh, Long term, we are very fortunate to work with a, a group, including obviously outstanding social workers, but also a nutritionist to really kind of address the needs of our patients. So there are clearly the social aspects of food and of eating, which become very different once a family member uh, is no longer uh, partaking at the dinner table, if you will. And one of my patients, who's just a really uh, well-motivated and very bright gentleman, has set up these luncheons once a month for all these patients with a G-tube, and they get together and they all um, have G-tube luncheons, um, because he said that he really missed having this kind of social aspect of, of eating. When patients come in to see us, once again, as practitioners who have not received training in these areas directly, um, it's very difficult for us to say, well, yes, please make sure you're taking 2,500 calories a day, but it's very important to really identify what type of nutrition, not just the number of calories, but the type of nutrition these patients are receiving, and also to really think about, have they really had proper swallow and speech therapy evaluation and uh, preservation? So when patients come in and they've been NPO for over a year and no one has really looked to see whether or not they're now able to swallow, I think that's one of the biggest gifts that we can offer patients is really to kind of delve into how is this affecting them, not just, you know, in terms of the proper nutrition, but also also in terms of their social and emotional well-being and looking at the next steps to kind of get them back from there. I think a lot of centers, even when we first set up multidisciplinary care, we do a very good job, Dr. Chandra Saker, telling uh, patients, hey, we're here, we can open the door for you, we recommend this surgery, we recommend this chemoradiation protocol, we recommend this clinical trial. 
But after, you know, months pass and there are the surveillance visits, is anyone really kind of looking globally about what is happening with the patient, how it is to be a survivor, uh, and how they're getting through that? And that's an area, I think, where we can all continue to improve and nutrition is one part of that, but of course there's all the kind of psychosocial well-being around nutrition that's also very important. I really was impressed um, as as Dr. Chetri and group uh, looked at it, as Dr. Malloy and, and Poe looked at it, um, really the, we want our patients to achieve that coveted designation of being a cancer survivor, but that's not where the care ends. And I, and I really impressed because um, I think that this naturally, your your approach naturally goes to not just identifying and treating the cancer, but then enabling the patient to have a full and satisfying quality of life as a survivor. And I love the G-tube lunch. That's awesome. It really is. I mean, he's really a fantastic uh, patient. We also have uh, another patient who was a uh, plaintiff's attorney. Uh, who had to have a total laryngectomy, and he went on to get a small monkey, and the monkey is able to do a lot of things for him and sits on his shoulder all the time. Uh, and he's trained this monkey to do this and actually kind of do things on his behalf. So we have some of these very well-motivated patients who really provide a lot of help. I had a gentleman who came to see me, had had a total laryngectomy and total glossectomy done in Chicago, and uh, when he came, they transferred to Los Angeles, he and his wife came to see me, and he was in his black turtleneck, and his, like, chin and mouth and whole body were, like, inside the, the black turtleneck. He's a thin gentleman. And, you know, I examined him, and he was about five years out. And I said, you know, well, you haven't had disease, but what else is going on? And, you know, he would write on his iPad, well, I have no reason to live, Dr. St. John. I can't do anything. And so I asked him, I said, well, what was it about your life prior to surgery that you enjoyed, um, you know, that went beyond, um, you know, your natural voice? Uh, at the time. And he wrote, well, I used to be a bowling champion. And I said, well, uh, sir, you know, I'd like you to go back to bowling. I said, the next time I see you in surveillance, I'm going to ask that you try to bowl once between now and the next time I see you in three months. Well, he came back with a huge smile on his face and he'd been back to his bowling thing and he's winning bowling titles. And now I see, you know, this is maybe three years ago. But his wife said to me that, you know, just finding something else in their lives that can still provide that meaning and get back to it has just made a huge difference. And so once again, we are setting up currently at UCLA now a survivorship clinic. Uh, you know, the uh, NCCN guidelines now ask us to uh, implement distress screening for our cancer patients. And so we have set up a survey at UCLA in terms of trying to uh, look at this in our head and neck cancer patient population. We're very fortunate to work with Dr. Patty Gantz, who's a survivorship expert at the NCI and who also happens to be UCLA. So we really are trying to champion this and push it forward because, as you mentioned, um, you know, and as mentioned in the chapter, you know, a cancer survivor is someone who's living with, through, and beyond a cancer diagnosis. And and we need to really understand this. Uh, you know, the, the chapter covers that post-traumatic stress disorder occurs in one out of three patients with cancer. And so all of this really needs to be looked into in order to allow these people to continue a quality of life that's meaningful for them and their families. That is that is really beautiful. Although I have to say, both of my sisters are lawyers, and now that you told me a monkey can do what they can do, that's going to be great at the next family. <laughs> You'll have to meet this guy. I'll have to send you his website. Yeah. Um, so I want to tell our listeners that Dr. St. John and I met each other maybe three or four years ago at one of the meetings, and... I looked at this young woman and I thought, well, maybe she's a senior resident and maybe she's just a fellow and she's charming and, you know, really engaging. And she looked at me and she asked me where I was doing my residency. And I said to her, well, I'm actually president of the American Academy of Otolaryngology. And she looked at me and two years later, she was chair of the department at UCLA. So um, I'm very grateful for our friendship. I think from because beginning to end, um, the clinics on the multidisciplinary approach to head and neck cancer, um, this podcast uh, where you talk about your motivation when, when listening to your patients, your friends, even the way your car beeps as you're about to hit the gate. Like these are all the things that advance our specialty. I think this is a really terrific issue of otolaryngologic clinics of North America. It was published 
published in August of 2017. It's really up to date. Um, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. I really hope our listeners have enjoyed this, and we'll go back and read some of these articles in further detail. So thank you so much, Dr. St. John, for taking the time. So, Dr. Chandrasekhar, I want to thank you uh, one more time, and I um, want to just make sure that, you know, uh, you are just someone who is really um, a beacon for so many of our trainees. We had the pleasure of hosting you here at UCLA as a distinguished speaker, and I can't tell you how many of my residents and trainees came to me and said she was fantastic and really changed the way I view um, my career path. I think your role here at the clinics is also um uh, an essential role because as we think to the future in terms of how we are uh, encouraging people to think um, and lead kind of by example in terms of making sure that what we want for our families is what we offer our patients and really thinking about, well, what I'm doing today is not going to be good enough in 15 years. How am I going to make it better? So I really thank you for providing us with the opportunity for creating such a network that we can really continue to focus on making the future brighter for all of us. And so I want to thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Sush. Oh, thank you, May. This was awesome. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Otolaryngologic Clinics podcast. For an exclusive discount on the issue we discussed today, focusing on multidisciplinary approach to head and neck cancer, visit us.elsevierhealth.com slash expert. Otolaryngologic Clinics is available for individual print subscription with accompanying online access, individual online only access, as well as on the Elsevier electronic platforms, Clinical Key and Science Direct. A CME program is also available. For more information on this series and our nearly 60 other titles spanning all medical disciplines, visit info.theclinics.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and subscribe to the Otolaryngologic Clinics podcast on iTunes and the Google Play Store.